thank you and hello everybody. So, yes, but indeed my name is Emma. Uh, I like to play with things like Raspberry Pis and microbits and Arduinos and things like that. I also do Python for a living. I do a lot of Django REST framework and Django. Uh, I'm a member of the PSF and DSF and I recently uh, joined Torchbox who's a UK-based employee-owned agency that's also responsible for Wagtail and whose raison d'etre is to emperor positive change makers. I'm still proud also of Levitt, and if you want to speak about Levitt things, you can find my colleagues in the room or myself. And I'm going to be talking about old things. I'm going to be talking about a Z80 CPU. And this is a bit anachronistic uh, at an age where people are talking about AI and things like that. So I thought I would ask AI to help me with illustrating my talk. And I asked AI to, to give me a, a chipset on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, this, is, this is going to be uh, a few other images in this talk are going to be produced by AI. Uh, so how did this happen? Well, when I was a kid and I was in primary school, we had something that looked like this. Not this, this is a modern machine that's a clone of, the, of a ZX80, but we had also a clone of the ZX80 that was in a case that looked a bit more like the case of the ZX81. All I know is that inside there was a Z80 CPU and it could do basics. And that's how I got interested in two computers. And then I had a friend who had a cousin who doubled the RAM on, the com on their computer. They had 16K and they, they put a 32K chip. All they do was to snip a leg on it and add a few botch wires and, and it worked. And I also knew someone who told me they knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who built their own computer. And this gave me a lot of ideas. I was really interested in computers. My parents didn't want to buy me a computer. They told me to set money aside to buy myself a computer when I could. So for my birthdays, Christmas and everything, I put money aside. And I, got, I finally got a computer and I got what was popular at the time which was this, and this was an IBM PC clone, and when I looked inside, I waited for my parents to be away to look inside. Uh, when I looked inside, it looked like this. And this is very much intimidating, much more intimidating than what uh, Commodore 64 would be, uh, would look inside. I still tinkered with that. I, I ended up, I added a sound card, I changed the video card to have EGA graphics, something that was really nice at the time. And this idea of building my own computer, it stayed in my mind, but it, it was way back in my mind. And then uh, the P word happened. And we all, we all had time on our hands and we watched a lot of YouTube videos. And I found the channel and I found the channel by this guy, Ben Eater, and he built a computer on a breadboard, and he used the 6502. Uh, I also saw this guy, who said that's nice to build a computer with an old CPU, but it is not useful if you cannot run software on it, and if you cannot plug into modern hardware. And he also uses the 6502. And 6502s are fun. And why did my slide go away? There. 6502s are fun. This is the list of all the 6502 based computers that there is there. It, there. There's a few lies. This Commodore 64 is not based on the 6502, it's the 6510. The C128 has two CPUs. It also has a Z80, that's why it's on this list as well. Uh, but this is the list of all Z80's computers. It's much longer. So if it's much longer, there's more chance that I can run software from one of those on something that I make myself. Um, and there's really impressive computers. There's, there's the Amstrad CPC, which when it came out, I, I knew 
but I had friends who got one, and it, it looked like a wonderful machine compared to something like uh, a VIC-20 or something like that. And, all, and, and some of those, they can run CPM. And if you don't know what CPM is, it's the ancestor of MS-DOS. And if you don't know what MS-DOS is, <laughs> when you open a command line in Windows, well, MS-DOS was the ancestor of that. So, and the source code for uh, CPM recently got made public, and you can build your own driver and you can run it on any Z80-based computer. And so, a, a bit more between the, the why choose a Z80 instead like of a 6502 like every, everybody else. Um, the Z80 is a bit nicer because uh, the 6502 has 64K to do everything, RAM, ROM, and I.O. This means that if you want to uh, sacrifice one pin for I.O., this means that you only have 32K, you divide by two. 32K left for RAM and ROM, and if you want two I.O. device, you only have 16K because you no, or no, have two pins that are wired to an I.O. device. Uh, while uh, the Z80 has 64K for RAM and RAM, and then it has 256 IOs. Um, and for testing, for debugging, for doing things, um, they say that the Z80 does what you would accept, expect a computer to do. It asks for what is at memory address zero to start with, and then goes on from there. The 6502 asks you what's in memory at SFFC. That's basically at the end of the address space. And then the first thing you have to do, because there is no room left, is to tell it to jump back at the beginning of the address space. Uh, so that's a bit annoying. And also there is a, a very special interaction in CPUs that's no up. It basically tells the CPU to do nothing. It does sound useless. But the fact that it does nothing is very useful when you're trying to just see if things work. And you know, of course, that 80 is just zero, 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 zero. So you can just take the data line, hook everything to ground, and then you can test your CPU. On a Z80, well, the instruction is EA, which you probably don't know how to wire that just from the top of your head right now. Um, and that's good, but... I want to do that with the Raspberry Pi Pico because the Raspberry Pi Pico has a lot of, of nice things and it can, it can do a, a lot of things, but it has 3.3 volts. And those things are from the 70s. Do they work in 3.3 volts? So there is absolutely no documentation that tells you that either of those does run at 3.3 volts. So I had to test it, and as I was saying, that it is easy to test, so I just wired uh, the, the address bus to some LEDs. I wired in the five volts from the Pi. I had to make sure that the CPU was running itself. This is something I, heard, I, I, I ordered on the internet from China. I, I have no idea if it works. So I, I hooked up everything, used the five volt from the Pi, I was planning to use a button as a clock signal to, to make sure it worked, but I didn't clean anything. So it ended up that when I plugged in, it picked up, it picked up the 50 hertz from the, from the mains voltage. So I plugged everything in and it started counting uh, the addresses. It was working, so I only had one thing to do was to switch the five volt with 3.3 volt. There's just one wire to switch and it did work. So, how come I even tried that? Well, I tried that because the thing I could find on the internet is that if it's CMOS, you can probably uh, do 3.3 volt. CMOS is really resilient. If it's the old chips that are NMOS instead of CMOS, uh, it will not work. And even with CMOS, it's probably better if you underclock it. And this is an AI rendition of underclock CMOS. <laughs> So, next step, we need a clock, and having a clock with uh, the Raspberry Pi is easy. Uh, there is in MicroPython, there is a timer, you can just build a timer, and so I did a bit more than that. I added some instruction to be able to change the frequency of the clock, 
And uh, now I have a clock running on this computer, and I can change the, the, the frequency of that clock, and what I see is that the computer, the CPU, is asking for the next instruction, and the address bus is starting to count up in binary. And that is great. But no, I have to do more than that. I have to interface the Z80 with the PyPico, and so I have to look at pinouts, and this is the pinout of the Z80 on the left, of the Raspberry Pi Pico on the right, and you can see that there is a lot of pins on both sides. What do we need? We need 16 bits of address, we need, we need 8 bits of data, memory request, IO request, read, write, and a clock. That's 29 pins. And if you look at the Raspberry Pi Pico, you, get, you see GPIO, they go from zero to 28, that's 29 pins, that's great. Yeah, except that four of those GPIOs are not mapped to pins, so you're missing four pins. So that's not working, and uh, basically this, this is also AI generated, and this is the victory of women over machine. Um, so it's, it's not a huge deal, so what? I have 16 bits, bits of address, I can sacrifice, four, four, I can get rid of four bits, and now I've got 12 bits of address, there's still 4K of RAM and ROM. That's plenty enough for this project. Um, and now I want to take a closer look at, at the Raspberry Pi Pico itself. So the Pico is really small, it's cheap, but it's got four CPUs inside it. It's got uh, a CPU that's got four cores. Two main cores to run Python and other stuff, and two really small cores, the PIO cores that are specialized in doing things like basically setting and waiting for interrupts, setting and reading pins, and sending, reading, and sending that data to a buffer that then you can read with the rest of your program. Uh, and that's really useful, it, and also it can be timed at any frequency you want, independent of the frequency of, of the computer, of the rest of the Raspberry Pi Pico. So it's really nice if you have a protocol to read, something like Serial, or if you want to, to read a protocol, there is absolutely no library, you can program that timing, that really specific timing in PIO. The Raspberry Pi Pico also does DMA, so you can have directory memory access, direct memory access. And to go back to the, to the 80s, this is the same thing as when you would be doing a peak or book with a, a Commodore 64. This is reading and writing directly in memory. You can do that with a Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, and this is some example of code that naively I thought would work. Uh, but this is PIO code, and as you can see, it looks like Python code, except it's this is assembly language, and it's, it runs really fast on the Raspberry Pi Pico. So now I have an idea of code. I have an idea of where I put my wires. So how do I get to talk, to get a Z80 to talk to a Raspberry Pi Pico? Well, this is when this kind of thing come, comes in handy. This is the M1 cycle timing of the CPU. So when the CPU needs an instruction, what does it do? Well, it will first uh, set the M1 signal low. Um, then it's going to put the address of the instruction it wants on the address bus. And then it's going to bring read and memory request low. And so at that point, you have one full memory cycle to populate the data bus with the instruction that the, the Z80 wants. One clock cycle, if those computers they used to use to, to run at one megahertz, the Raspberry Pi Pico runs at 133 megahertz. So one full clock cycle of the Z80, that's an eternity. You have plenty of time to give that instruction there. So, when read goes low, I can tell the Pico to run this method. And what does this method do? It reads the data line, it reads the address from the address lines, and it uses DMA to do that. So it gets all the bits of the, of the, 
of the line, and then it goes into a variable that's called self-memory, that is a whole map of the whole memory of the Z80 that it's going to need, which is much smaller than what the memory that the, the Pico has, and says, you all send that back to the data line. And it's, this is so, you have that much time that you could even, even bit bank the thing instead of using DMA. <clears throat> And when you do that, well, this, this contraption it still works. So here with a, with a memory array that only has uh, numbers going from one to, uh, I don't remember, uh, if, I, if I do that and I change the frequencies, you can see that it's still working and I still have the less counting up. Except no, it's hooked up to the data line, not to the address line. And so this data can be sent to the Z80, but if I send a bunch of instructions that are just one, two, three, four, five to the Z80, it's probably going to crash because I don't even know if all those instructions are actual instructions that the Z80 can understand. So what else can I put in, in the memory? I can put an assembly a program in assembler, in Z80 assembler. Uh, not exactly this, this is what you're going to write if you write assembler, then you have to assemble it. And it's going to give you a bunch of ones and zeros. It's going to give you instructions that the Z80 can run. And since the, the Raspberry Pi Pico has a flash memory, you can store the program in assembly directly in the flash of the Pi Pico, and when everything boots up, you tell the Pico to load that program, and then it's going to work. Okay, but that's, that's not really a computer yet. Now, you can tell the computer to do stuff, but it's not like you can interact with the computer. Uh, it's reading instruction, it's doing things, but that, that's about it. Uh, but this is a minimalist Raspberry Pi computer, once again, thanks to AI. Um, so we can and should do better with I.O. And uh, since there is an I.O. request line on the Z80, we can use that line to have the CPU do something. And uh, there's 256 address of I.O., so you can have plenty of things. Uh, fancy, thing, fancy things like a cassette tape or a punch cord reader or even a screen and a keyboard. Or you can simply have just a Raspberry Pi Pico that is going to be hooked up in a, with a serial terminal on your, lap, on your laptop and is going to just send things back to you as text. <clears throat> and going back a few step backs, you remember that I said, well, I can sacrifice four bits. Depending the speed at which I want to run things, I can use shift registers and uh, transform 16 bits of parallel data into 16 times one bit of serial data. Uh, since the Raspberry Pi is so much faster than the Z80, this is very possible. Um, with the uh, 74HC165, which is very common with OBS projects, you will not be able to, be, to do that and run the CPU at full speed because at 3.3 volts it tells you that it's going to work at six megahertz. So that's, that's a bit too short to run a CPU at 10 megahertz, of course. But yeah, it's still doable. So we can have now a, a computer that has a full memory address that can talk and that can do stuff. Um, I did mention VGA and external keyboard and disk drive and things like that. And unfortunately, if you had a look here, you can see that there is no such thing as a, a disk drive or a cassette player on this. I didn't get that far, but somebody else did. And uh, this is a picture of, a, once again, a 6502. I don't know why everybody uses a 6502. This is a, a picture of a 6502 computer on a breadboard with a Raspberry Pi that drives the VGA signal because PIO is really good at timing, remember. So it can do the timing right to create a VGA signal. 
Uh, it's also uh, acting as USB host for keyboards, and this is what on the right you can see it in action. But that's not mine. So, do do you want to see mine in action? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, first of all, I, do you remember see the picture just before how, how the computer looks? And do you know this thing that people take images from Instagram uh, of people looking gorgeous and then they try to do the same thing and they look like, well, this is the version of that. Um, so the code I'm going to run is that, which basically is a loop that increments a register and sets it in memory and keeps going. Um, Yep. For this, I have this. I'm going to plug in the computer so it has power, and I have the serial line. And I can reboot it. And so I can look and see the memory because I, I created those instructions in, in Python. It's at the very bottom of the screen. I'm going to, to try to move that. Um, so this, this is my whole program in Z80 Assembler. It's at address zero. And now if I tell the CPU to run at a frequency of a whopping 100 hertz, 100 hertz, nothing happens. Because everything is happening in memory. And the, the program writes numbers at address 03B. If I look now, I've got 28. And if I look now, I've got 48, so this is working. <laughs> Thank you. Let's not stop there. I, I, I mentioned I.O. This is not I.O. This is me looking inside the memory. So, so I'm going to do something which is much more advanced in computer science. Uh, and I'm going to... I have a screen here. I'm going to save... I'm going to hold reset on the CPU first. I'm going to save a copy of this program on the Pico is main.py. If you needed a proof that this was Python, this is Python, main.py. Um, and now I'm going to store that program. I'm going to set the frequency to 100 hertz again. I'm going to let go of the button and it says hello world. I know this is still not very impressive, but this is, this is as much as I got, I know got IO. And this is a program that does that. There's basically two instructions, 3E that loads a value into A, and D3 that is the, um, the instruction for output. And since I've got all the uh, IOs wired to the Pi, I'm outputting, outputting to zero, and so I'm loading every letter, the, the ASCII character for the, for the letter, in memory. Thank you. Yeah. Loading all the um, every letter in memory and then sending it to the output. Once again, this is very basic. I would have loved to go a bit further and to be running CPM in front of you. I didn't get that far, but uh, it has all the ingredients necessary to do that, just with a bunch of wires a Z80 CPU that you can barely, barely see on the left underneath all the wires and a Raspberry Pi Pico. All the LEDs are just less leftovers of me debugging. That's all there is. are not available, but this, this is 
not too complicated, so I can, I can make the schematics for you. If you're staying for the sprints, I will have this for the sprints. Uh, come, and we can do the schematics and upload, it to, upload them to GitHub. Uh, but basically, it's just wiring the data bus and wiring the, the, the address bus. There's a few pings that go to high or, or low, and that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And then, yeah, I'm sure we can, we can Okay, uh, we have about five minutes now to change.